All right. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for um, another series of our own art conversations with artists. Tonight, we're really excited to be speaking with curator Tia Santana, who's going to be speaking with artists who are part of um, the Unapologetic Conversations exhibition at the Delaware Contemporary this summer. Tia and artists, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I just wanted to start off just by, uh, I guess, introducing the viewers to my vision. Um, as an artist, I remember um, so often applying for shows um, and um, applying for shows um, that, um, and, and ha having to basically um, kind of like conform to what the, the artist call was and not being able to find um, shows that I that I felt like was relevant to my work or um, the selection process wasn't really relevant to what I was doing. Um, and this was um, this was before like the movement now <laughs> where like every call for entry is about um, identity and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and and that sort. Um, but I remember just feeling defeated because um, we're walking into a gallery space, specifically um, in urban communities and not being able to see representation of not just myself, but representation of, um, of, of people of color. Um, and it felt secluded and it felt isolated. Um, and being in gallery spaces and uh, you, you, in these gallery spaces, um, these white gallery spaces where um, you know, I had my master's degree and I was just as educated, but I still felt the isolation because I just felt like the conversations around the work sometimes I felt like um, didn't apply or I just didn't have, um, I just didn't have a sense of belonging. And I think at one point I felt so defeated that I wanted to, I just said, hey, well, I'll start making work that fits this. Um, I'll start making work that fits the description of what the calls are looking for, or I'll start making work that fits um, what people are looking for in the conversations, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll change instead of um, saying, no, I need to change the system. I said to myself, you know, I'll change to adapt to the system. Um, and I think that that was um, something that was um that was a part of my experience for a very long time. Um, and I think recently just this opportunity to um, start to realize how valuable um, not only my practice was, but myself as an educator and being true to who I am and also being, um, being representative in the classroom um, to other students um, who, are up and coming in the arts um, field, I, I felt that that was really relevant to be true to myself. And I'm glad that, that I did, and I'm glad that this, this work and this opportunity was available. So with that, we ran it, you know, we, we had this opportunity of unapologetic conversations here and nonconformity. Um, so I just wanted to pass the torch to any artist who would like to just talk uh, or just share their perspective on the accessibility of uh, the importance of this work um, that you are doing and how it can speak to, um, to, 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 to different communities um, uh, in, in the arts. Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, my name is Robin Phillips Pendleton, and I am a professor of visual communications at the University of Delaware. And um, I've been at Delaware since 1996. And my main focus, um, just as a maker, um, was illustration and graphic design. So, and that's what I also teach. But I have opened up um, a lot of my teaching and my own practice uh, to teaching uh, painting, teaching drawing, and really kind of recategorize myself as a storyteller. And I like to tell all kinds of stories, um, 
personal stories, stories uh, by other people, uh, young, old, um, you know, any race, uh, really. And I've also been um, focusing a lot on research and writing and research and writing around illustration and responsibility and race. And so that has led me to publish work. That's led me to uh, a current curatorial position um, with the Norman Rockwell Museum, where we're working on a we're working on an exhibition for uh, June 2022 about illustration, um, race, and responsibility. So it's it's really parallel parallels my own work and um, with illustration research and the idea of identity identity and who talks about identity and what does identity mean. And this show was a, a really great opportunity to tell a story that I was already thinking about, about race, um, about hair, my own hair journey, and how, how I found that journey. And through the research, how my journey and the journey of my ancestors coincided. So that research in um, identity through hair, what does that mean? What did that mean for um, enslaved people? What does that mean? Um, what did that mean for me as a, as a child? And what does it mean now? So the work that um, I was able to uh, exhibit at the show um, is really about that. And again, you know, these layers of what my title is, titles are now and uh, creatively, um, they're interwoven. Thanks, Robin. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, I think I, I can, I can start now. So my name is Michael Dika, um, originally from Ghana. Um, I've been in Delaware since 2019, so I guess that's two years now. Um, I'm a clay, I'm a ceramic artist. I use clay as my medium to talk about um, identity, um, my cultural background and how that translates to my new environment. Um, I've currently been researching on how to talk about my identity as a Ghanaian as a black person in America and how um, how my culture is really represented in America. In saying that I think I've also been, been doing a little research and actually starting a little Cretoria project, which is actually having about seven Ghanaian artists all, all in the US to talk about how their current environment translates to how they, they how their culture, how their background translates in their new environment. Um, this is going to happen in November, that's in fall. So um, it's something I've actually been thinking about. So pretty much thinking about this show, I think I totally agree with Tia. I mean, applying for shows, I've been trying to like conform to like you know, the requirements of the show and actually changing or tweaking my works to fit the, to fit certain requirements of certain shows. And I thought like this, um, this exhibition was one, was one exhibition that actually hit me differently because it was something that I've been thinking about a lot and actually researching on. And it also translates to how I perceive myself in America as a black person and also how I'm forced to like conform to the constructs and labels of in which I'm being put in as a black African-American who has no um, experience, yet um, I'm being put in that box or as a category in that category. And I can actually engage in a very tangible conversation as a black person because then I don't have the same history um, sometimes. And it, it's kind of hard. So I think this shows was very was very interesting to me and I thought I'll actually use play as a way of 
immortalizing my experiences in, in this new environment to talk about non-conformity and, and being unapologetic about it. So this was a way of letting myself lose and not thinking about, you know, meeting requirements and meeting um, expectations by just letting myself free and just doing something that I think I really enjoy. And I think hair, hair has been one of the basic issues that um, I think about, particularly in Ghana, where you can't have, you know, you can't actually braid your hair. You are actually put in a different category as a tag or, you know, um, as someone who is like a misfit in, 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 a, in a new, in a different way. So being able to be part of this show to express um, that idea freely without holding back was, was a very interesting way for me as an artist to put myself out there. So um, yeah, pretty much that, that's it for me. Thank you, Michael. I'll go. Hi, I'm Stephanie Richardson. I'm really new to uh, at least the gallery scene. You know, this is like one of my one of my first shows, not like really my first, but um, I'm an artist based in Delaware and in PA. And I just feel like as black people who have been, you know, touched by colonization, like whether you're in the diaspora or in like Africa, we I feel like we are constantly questioning our place in the world. We're constantly questioning like how much of our culture will still be here um, in time. And I think a lot of my pieces uh, do reflect on um, identity and like how the people who come into your life affect, affect change into your life and leave their mark into you. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, my mind's kind of like <laughs> going off, but I definitely um, really appreciated the show because it was so amazing seeing like so many black artists in this space, even in the other um, exhibitions that were there and all of us just being unapologetic about who we were and you know, really reaching into ourselves to have these conversations about what our place is in, society, in, in a world where, you know, our bodies were commodified, you know? So I definitely am appreciative of you giving us all the opportunity to you know, present our work and share our stories. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I'd like to um, actually echo some of the things that Robin had said that really um, resonated with me. I'll introduce myself really quickly. I'm a hair sculptor. Um, I did part of the show that is actually an open installation of hair. Um, a lot of the show are um, actual pieces hanging on the wall, but these are actually like hair pieces that are on the wall um, in more of an installation setting. Um, I do rituals and that's a part of the work. Um, I create headdresses as well as installations and the headdresses are worn or activated rather during rituals. And we did a ritual in the museum that was more of a blessing ritual. Um, we don't put a lot of trust in the law, or at least I don't because of the history that has happened with the law that um, black and brown bodies are not truly protected under the law the way other bodies are. And so um, it is more of a hope that this is a change that will um, slowly come to pass that we will actually witness in our lifetimes. That's at least what I was intending with the ritual that we did in the museum. Um, I'm also a BIPOC filmmaker. So a lot of the rituals that I do, we film to create this ripple effect that it's it's precious because it's done in the moment and it's sacred, but hopefully in the film as well, it has these ripples that will go out from that place. Um, and I've actually started creating a registry of the different sites that have been cleansed with chalk or smoke or movement um, because a lot of the rituals that I do are cleansing of historically traumatic spaces for black bodies. But obviously the, the one at the museum was more of a blessing ritual, which was really powerful. Um, what I was excited about with this show, a friend of mine actually sent it to me and I was outside the radius. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> and I think it was like 25 miles outside. And I was like, you know what, what's meant for me will come for me. And I wanted to respect um, what that was. And I actually, um, somebody who was actually working with the museum mentioned my name to Tia and Tia was able to reach out. And I was very excited. I was like, I know about this show. I was mad that they had a radius set. I know about this show. <laughs> I was like, when have I ever seen a show that wanted hair? Like, this is my thing, like, let's go. So, um, and that's one thing that I'm thankful for about being a hair sculptor is that it's very specific. And it's, it's funny, people will ask me like, why are you working with hair? And I'm like, I think it's always been about hair. I don't know why, 
It has always been, and my sister's a, a dog groomer. So I'm like, why are we obsessed with hair? Like, <laughs> and it's, it's not really um, hair, right? It's a vehicle for storytelling, right? And Robin was saying that she was a storyteller. Um, I didn't know I was, but in grad school, they were like, wow, you're a storyteller. And I'm like, am I? And they're like, yeah. I was like, cool. So harnessing that, but um, no, it's just really exciting to see a show like this because I'm, I'm definitely drawn to events that have never happened before. And like, you know, part of my rituals is part of that, but I feel like this show is part of that. And like at the opening, it just felt like there was so much black joy in those rooms, you know, and I'm so used to like, oh, we have a little minority exhibit. It's this little corner over here. It's like a janitor's closet, you know, like that's what I'm used to. And this was just like, we taken over, get used to it. Like it was just beautiful. And I feel as though the US may be moving into some sort of renaissance um, of just blackness. And I just, you know, I hope this is the taste of things to come, you know, like my heart reaches out with hope, but with caution, <laughs> because we know our history. And it just, you know, we hope we're not going to do the cha cha and slide back, right? We hope that it's just forward movement, <laughs> not one step forward, one step back, let's just keep it moving. So, um, you know, we just, we manifest those intentions, we set those intentions here and now, but also, you know, into our future. So. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Oh man, that just, uh, I think that just filled my heart. Um, yeah, so <laughs> moving forward, I think I wanted to just talk to each one of you about now that the show is over and it's done, right? And you've had time and each individual person had time to work, you know? Um, and I think that this work was pretty, um, uh, pretty emotional, like pretty, like it, it was pretty personal for each individual artist. So, you know, when I first had the opportunity to invite each one of you to the show, you know, we talked about um, your visions for the artwork and, you know, the excitement for the opportunity. I just wanted to check back in now that the show is over and the artwork has been made and, you know, uh, just, I guess, like, you know, get like a little bit more of an inside scoop of how you're feeling about the overall outcome, you know, and how you're feeling personally, how you're feeling overall about the entirety of the show um, and what you're looking forward to for the future. Well, I'll respond. Um, I'm, I'm just looking forward, I'm looking forward to um, more opportunities like this. Um, I think originally, uh, I didn't, I didn't have the work. So I, I, I saw the call and I had, um, I had the story and the drawing or a similar drawings in my sketchbook. And I was talking to Tia about it. And I'm like, so I said, okay, you know, here's the opportunity to, really just go hard at a proposal and would they take this proposal idea this visual proposal idea and they did and Tia did and um I was just so um excited when I got on the the zoom call with Tia and she invited me to be in the show and, and I was like oh you know I'm seeing these eight by ten black and white drawings as three feet by four feet <laughs> and Tia goes yeah yeah <laughs> and I said yeah they're gonna be you know monochromatic and you know it, it was like okay that's pretty big for me <laughs> but you know seeing it on the wall you know seeing it done seeing it on the wall I mean I I while I was doing the work, it just really grew and evolved and some things happened and textures and um, gold paint and all kinds of stuff happened in that three feet by four feet, you know, by like nine feet for the whole panel. And just being at the, at the opening and looking and watching other people receive the work because I kind of go back and forth between, um, you know, a fine artist, a commercial artist, and, you know, you know, these sort of uh, straddling what people can, would consider barriers. I don't always exhibit, but sometimes I do. So it's really 
interesting for me to, um, to just observe people looking at work, you know, looking at other people's work, looking at my work and, you know, and I, the way that I teach, you know, it, it really reinforced the way that I teach. Cause I'm like, okay, I teach this way. I, I teach students to, to not only tell stories, but to um, really uh, design the work so that, you know, for effect and, and how long people want viewers to stay in the work, you know, cause you can, you, can, you can make work where someone just, you know, looks at it and just walks by but how long do you really want someone to, to receive the work, to, to internalize it, to walk up to it, to step back from it, to you know, have this more intimate experience. And so I watched that happen you know, with, with my work. And I don't, I, I, I was convinced looking at that, that it was the right size. I mean, because it had to be big, it had to be, what it was in order for that to happen. And so a lot of the things around, you know, that sketchbook, it was just bigger than I imagined. Um, you know, I designed it, but yet, you know, it came to fruition. So that was really exciting. Thank you. Would anyone else like to talk about their experience? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can go, Michael. All right. And thank you, Seth. All right. So, yeah, I think I think this was really exciting for me, um, particularly as as a sculptor. I think um, I think what really got me to make um, those particular small sculptural pieces was the idea that the sculpture has to be very big, large, and I'm like. Um, this is very personal to me and this is very intimate. So then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make really small sculptures and like have everyone investigate and come close to the sculptural pieces and, and reach out to feel or get to understand what, what it means to be black or what it means to be, um, you know, a brown body in the white space. Um, so I think thinking about that, that actually informed my, my, thought process for making those very small sculptures. And I think my color choices, uh, I try to use like gold and yellow to reference my background. Um, and then like using very organic and natural colors to reference, you know, um, my space as to how that translates into the sculpture. So I'm like, how do I get people to investigate or be more intrigued about, um, you know, conversations that has to do with blackness or that has to do with um, you know um, people of color so then I'm like yeah let me actually go for a very small um, sculpture piece and also I think um, being at the show and seeing how people reacted to um, like all this like the installations the whole put up to the show I'm like wow this is amazing like I want to have more of this and I mean, the feeling was like surreal. I just wanted, I couldn't believe um, like the engagement and how everyone was like, actually really excited and interested to know more about um, hair and like stories of black people and all of that. It was, it was, it was I think I've never felt that way in, in a gallery space until that. And I'm really thankful for Tia for like putting up the show um, and making me feel that as, as a black person in the white space. So, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, I was really excited for this show because I feel like anytime I'm with, you know, other black people and we're all like fellowshipping in like the same space, like I'm always, it's always just a great vibe, a great energy. And um, when I went to, when I first saw the um, call for the show, I had, I guess, two pieces done, the um, self-manifest piece and the, um, I think the window change one and the helping hand piece is I actually started creating that the day I saw the um, call for the show. Cause I was like, oh my goodness, I definitely want to uh, draw, like have focus on hair. And I want to have like um, hands playing with the hair, touching the hair, getting in their space. So that conveys some of like the personal discomfort I felt like with 
you know, white people or even other other people just coming into my space without, you know, really my permission or without any really regard of how I felt. And I thought that, um, you know, a lot, a lot of our identity is it's derived from what people uh, say about our work, say to us, say, you know, about our, our um, experiences. And I wanted to just really reflect on, you know, what, what really is my experience? Like, what is, um, like, what do I want to say about myself? Do I want to accept what people have projected onto me or do I want to present myself in my own way? So like, that's kind of like the, it was like a three piece kind of um, series that kind of reflected on, you know, that aspect of identity. And I was definitely blown away by all of your works. Like I definitely was staring at Robin's piece for like a good 15 minutes. <laughs> and I, I, I was actually talking to you a little bit about it when I saw it. And I was like, oh my God, like when you got closer, it was like all this fine detail. It was just amazing seeing everyone's pieces. Like the, the one with the beads was definitely one of my favorites. I think it was just beautiful. The whole experience was just amazing. And I definitely want to have more experiences where I'm around other artists of color who are um, just passionate about their work and excited about what's, you know, what's going on around them. Thank you, Stephanie. You hit on a few points right there. And one of the points that you hit on was, I think that all of the work, every, every last um, art, work of art that I selected, um, I saw the potential for people to stay. I, I, I felt like there was potential in each individual work for people to investigate. And I also saw the diversity in each piece, um, in each individual artist and their work and what that would bring in conversation because nothing is monotone. Like we don't want to tell like one story, but we wanted to tell many stories. So I thought that that was really vital and really important um, to not just have like one story told, but a, you know, a series of stories and a collective series of stories where not, none of the stories, they, they all had similarities and they all had these like common reoccurring themes um, but at the same, um, in the same, um, uh, in the same, Brittany, I'm sorry, don't cut this part out, but it's just my brain and I can't think about the word right now. Um, like in the same sentence, I'll use it that way. Um, each of one of the works, each, each of your works were, um, I think that they were like performative. Um, when I think about, when I thought about uh, Liz's work um, as she was the performance artist, um, the longer I stayed in that space and I've had an opportunity to go back and sit in that space and walk through that space and consistently like be in that space. And I can also remember the performance that happened in that space and through that space. I feel the change and I feel the shift like that was in that space, knowing what happened in that space, even if there's a video of what happened in that space. I can always reflect, reflect back and have that memory of that. But I also think just the transformation of these materials and this material of hair being used in the way that it's artistic and creative. And I think that in our in the communities of color, um, I think that the um, use of hair is one that is um, expressive and is artistic. But I feel like in the galleries, it's being used as a tool, like an artistic tool, and it's being used as like a sculptural tool. And I think that that is such a great performance piece that it just changes the space. Um, and it, 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 it conforms the space so that the space feels different, um, especially in these, in these, in these large white um, gallery walls. And I, I'm, I was laughing because I know Michael said that his work is small. <laughs> It's small. Um, it's small to him because his pieces are really large. <laughs> but <laughs> I think about the size and the scale. But I, I thought something that um, when I selected Michael's work, the first thing that I thought was when I think about ceramics and I, and I looked at the work and I think about how nonconforming it was for a ceramics piece, how you had to walk up, you had to investigate and like really figure out what this was. And then just walking around that piece and it drew you in closer because you know, the scale of it, for me, I thought it was a nice side scale, but in looking at all of his other works, I know that it is small, but it still brings you, it still brought me closer. And then juxtaposed to that, like I, I was thinking about uh, Robin's piece, who I felt like that piece is like a performance in itself because it was so large and so grand. And it just, it, it demanded the space that it had on that wall. So you had to, like you, you went in, and you can feel like an overwhelming sense in the presence. And not everyone is familiar with the history of, um, of, of, of the, um, the slaves and um, how they um, hid food in their hair and used mapping and those things. But it definitely 
if, if I didn't know, it would have definitely made me research it. it. Would have definitely made me take an interest to see, okay, like what's going on here? And I thought that that was very interesting. And then Stephanie's work, you know, I, I could stand and look at that work for a very long time. You know, there are just so many compartments and there are so many different visual elements there in that work that is, you know, it's mind blowing. And, and I feel like that work has its own interpretation and its, and its narrative. But I think that each one of your pieces, um, I wanted to say thank you again, because I felt like all of the work was performance like it it was all very captivating um that which the overall space not you know everyone's work in this space I, I felt was captivating so I just wanted to add that little detail in there well I'm gonna jump back in to respond to the initial <laughs> question about um what it was like to see the work in the space and to create the work um, I created my work as a prompt from Tia, where she was like, ah, would you consider making something completely new? And I was like, oh my God, it's spring, my busiest season. Sure, let's do it. Like, <laughs> cause I, um, I am a glutton for punishment. I love to just make it happen. So, but no, I like a challenge. I really do. And, um, I'm fascinated and really intrigued and seduced by, by the work that I'm doing. And it's, it's not something that I cannot make. So having an opportunity to follow a prompt, um, kind of like, you know, back in school, having a prompt and being like, oh, I'm going to answer this prompt, you know? Um, so the opportunity to fill a space, um, there's a quote by Kusama that I really love. And she um, shares about how she has worlds inside of her. And that really resonates with me um, as I create headdresses that are activated by performers or um, I'm really, um, drawn to patterns and like what ended up happening is that these edges created these patterns and like um, how I make the the edges I had never done it before so I was like let's prototype this mess because I don't know what this is going to work out but I had made something similar so I was like fingers crossed and my instincts are on but it was um, a really beautiful like discovery process I actually had to shift the concept um, a couple times you know it's it's the conversation that you have with the materials, right? It's like, I have a dream, I have an idea, and you're gonna let me know how far you're willing to go with me on this, or we're gonna shift it. It's gonna arrive somewhere different than what I imagined when we started this journey. And that was definitely, um, you know, a pleasurable experience at where we arrived. Like those combs, those combs above the door, like I stood them up, I like had just rented a different apartment. I had like been working in the apartment as a studio. The combs are taller than me, I'm 6'2". But like when they hang above the door, I was like, they look like they're nothing. These things are huge. <laughs> and it's just, um, it's, it was definitely a learning experience. I show regularly um, and I've been driven to show regularly and I've been very, um, blessed um, to have people interested in my work. Um, and But showing at a museum is a different thing. And it's a really lovely opportunity to have. It's an honor and a privilege. But um, also, it's a huge learning experience. Like, I had never driven a lift. I was like, vroom, vroom, let's go. Like, <laughs> hope I don't break this. <laughs> like, I'll sign a waiver. What's happening? I don't know. But anyways, um, no, it was a lot of fun, but also just a tiny bit of torture and I mean, you know, I think that's all art. It's it's always a little bit rough to be like, don't mess this up, get it right. So, but it was exciting to see people looking at the work um, as well as the performance. I'm still learning about these rituals and they're learning me and I'm exploring them and they're exploring me. And um, it was a pleasure to explore another permutation of that concept that I'm exploring in the Delaware contemporary. Cause I didn't really understand that Delaware um, I didn't know that, Del honestly, I didn't know that Delaware is so black. I just want to be honest. Like I knew black people from Delaware, but I didn't know y'all rolled like that. And then Friday, you know, I was like, wow, y'all rolled to the museum on Friday? Y'all look good, what's up? You know, like it was exciting, but um, I just didn't know. That's not how it is in Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore. So I was like, oh, like Baltimore, we got to pick this up. This is how we need to do things. But um, no, it was very exciting. And it was, um, I, even though I was like really stressed at the time, I was like, oh my God, I hope it works out. Um, it was really fun. I was able to be present in the moment and really have a lot of joy in that space because it felt like the energy in the space had changed. I don't often go into a museum and feel joy. I'm like, oh, these works are beautiful and I'm inspired. But like, 
in that museum. I was like, this must be what white people feel all the time. This is joyful in here, <laughs> you know? So that's how I really feel. That's what I really felt. <laughs> yes, come through all the way. <laughs> I was like, am I being too silly? My bad. Like <laughs> I'm gonna share a little tidbit for the for the viewers. The night before Liz was doing the installation work. And I walked past and I was there and I was, I walked past a few times and I was like, they're laying edges on the wall. <laughs> and she was, she was on like the left side of the wall. And I saw like how long it was taking. And I was like, it's gonna take a minute. So I went and got something to eat and I came back and like, you know, like a while passed. And, and, and she brought a crew with her too. So she had a crew, a crew and they were like, literally like sculpting like the hair to the wall. And it dawned on me and I said, I think we're going to be here <laughs> for the long run. But I do remember at one point I said, man, I was, do I need to go out there and help Liz ladies edges? <laughs> Could have used your help to you. I'm just saying. <laughs> I was like, she probably, she, she probably saw my edges. was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, the two people I brought, I had one white assistant and then I had one of my performers, but she don't do hair. And I was like, why did I not like hire somebody <laughs> perfect? But it's not the same because we we're like had tracks connected to the wall, like laying actual tracks. It's not the same as knowing how to do yo ed. Like, I was like, I don't even know how to like hire somebody for this. <laughs> like, what kind of job description do I write? Can you lay edges on a wall? Why would you ever lay edges? Like, what? <laughs> That's, you know, that's, imp that's important. And I think I t touched base on this, you know, like, I don't know, like, if you should know, but I think, you know, you know, okay, so I know how to do a lot of, you know, like, like, I know how to draw people, white people, and um, I, I know how to do a lot of different things. I think that we should, you know, growing up, even looking at the, like, the Crayola packs of, like, you know, like, coloring the skin, I think that there should, you know, I think that there should be some diversity in this education of, you know, uh, how we present, you um, you know ourselves and 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 how we make it accessible um, to others as well. And I think that there's something you know. Um, I remember you saying, Liz, um, and also Robin, um, in your both your interviews, how getting your hair done it's a ritual. It's a it's mm -hmm. a community thing. It's a private thing. You know, it happens. You you it's it's you know, it's kind of like a oh like a, a place of worship in a sense. Oh, yeah. And it's private. It's very private because <laughs> you know and like how do we talk about this openly or do some people want to talk about it openly I remember talking to um Lebo Heng um and she is the um the artist from Johannesburg and she was telling me how you know some people feel offended when we're talking about our hair um when you talk about your hair in like a public space like you know like why are you using this like why are you doing that why are you kind of like basically like putting our business out there um but I think that that's an interesting um thing to think about is the accessibility to these conversations and um, I guess to, to a culture practice as well, to these practices. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, can I just jump in real quick? Um, something, you know, what you just said is part of, again, part of my story, I mean, about the Brett girl that's in the work because the Brett girl, you know, th there was this, there was this notion when I was growing up in the 70s, I knew all about white people's hair, but I felt like nobody knew anything about mine and didn't want to know other than to feel it or, you know, but they didn't really want to know. So, you know, when that Brett girl came on the commercial on, on Saturdays and interrupted my soul train flow, you know, I was kind of like, okay, what's going on? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I kind of felt like, well, you know, is, is our other cultures receiving information about our hair? We're, we're certainly receiving theirs, you know, and I always, I always felt like that was a lopsided kind of thing. Um, but I do, I do, you know, remember it was head and shoulders and Brett. That was pretty much it for shampoo back then. <laughs> so, yeah, there's some things you just don't forget, and I don't. And I don't forget, you know, ponytails swinging. 
either because mm -hmm. that was that was going to be one of the the um images in the piece it didn't make it in but that was always you know the thing it's like the perfect ponytail you know according to some cultures yeah so, so i guess kind of like maybe a um Maybe a question that I have and anyone can answer is what next, right? So, you know, when I look at, when I look at Instagram or if I look at Twitter now, you know, I see all these beautiful little black babies or all these, these beautiful ethnic babies and they are rocking like they're, they're puffs, they're rocking like they're little froze. I mean, and they're like unapologetically, like if you don't yeah. like my hair it gets that's on you. Like they're, I mean, and you know, they're wearing like, you know, they're going and you know, we, they, they are going into their classrooms and they're feeling mm -hmm. more confident, more confident to say, it's not my problem. It's your problem. If you don't know, mm -hmm. well, maybe you need to get with it. And I think that that confidence, like, you know, like that confidence of not having to conform to Eurocentric standards, because, you know, there's a, there's a Eurocentric, a Eurocentric standard that sets the tone of what beauty is. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, have and are and hopefully will continue to define and I think especially as artists like you know what our beauty is and what each individual um you know you, you each encourage people to identify and define their own beauty um unapologetically without having to conform um to what someone else's views or opinions are of themselves and I think that you know social media is a great um way to leverage that um it's very accessible and I think you know um art is a is a really um great way as um to also access that so um if anyone wants to answer that question like what next how do we continue these conversations how do we support other artists of color and these calls to um discover and be, you you always hear well there are black artists but we can't find them um, so, you know, we put out, we put out a, um, we did put out a, a call. Where, where, are they? where, I know that they're there. So how do we continue to support each other and lift each other up and be able to say, you know, and, and be able to network, um, and make it a norm that this is happening. What are your thoughts? Because each one of you has a different um, a different medium that you work in. So, what are some of your thoughts on that? I mean, for myself, um, what next? How do we keep this moving? One, um, I always say, make sure you're nurturing yourself so that you are always participating. Um, I got asked the question of like you know, what's your symbol of success to continue doing the work, right? And to continue pushing um, into new lines of investigation, you know, the work kind of metamorphosizes slightly or permutates, right? Um, so I would say true, staying true to yourself. I love what Robin was saying about reading. I have like a title list that I'm like, I got to get to that, right? <laughs> I'm picking up the books on Audible. I'm like, I got to be listening. Um, so nurturing the work and diving deep. Um, making sure that it's rooted in excellence, make sure it's rooted in knowledge. And um, we can only be as good as um, we're taking in vital information as well. We always have more to learn, right? But I find um, a lot of times I'm always open to collaborations. So if somebody's like, man, I love this part of your work, or what would you think about this? Like um, collaborations, I find that being around other artists, especially, you know, I just finished my um, graduate degree at MICA, being around other artists without realizing it, not everybody articulates it, but it's iron sharpening iron, right? And so like, I find that even studio visits, I regularly do Zoom studio visits. I don't even have like time to go places, but I know people around the country and just sharing, this is what I'm working on with artists who have parallel fields of study mm -hmm. is really powerful. And if we find ways where we can intersect and do a project together, a film together, it's um, really nurturing. And I think that that's what we need, especially coming into a post pandemic world into, you know, a time of defund the police, but like, you know, what's actually happening with that? I don't know. Just waiting for the next headline, you know, like my, um, I'm on edge with that, but um, kind of just uh, making sure that we're filling our own cup and um, being aware of reaching out to others and valuing their work, paying them for their work with collaborations. 
um, and feeding energy to one another in our community um, and listening to the ancestors as well. I think that like, you know, there's a lot of guidance that is being given to us if our hearts are open and if we're open to that, um, that gentle guiding to where we need to be. So that would be my perspective. Thank you, Liz. I mean, I would echo that too. Um, collaborations and and being unapologetic about a lot of things, you know, the kind of work you do, um, the the things that you want to say, you know, being ready when there is a call. But you know, because you you, you know that self care, um, you know, as Liz was talking about. I mean, so if you're doing that all the time and the call comes, you know, you're you're ready because you have something to say. You you've been saying it and you've been um, you know, extending your thought process. Um, I mean, I had an opportunity um, on Saturday. I happened to be talking to a friend of mine who has a, has a gallery in Brooklyn. And I was talking about the, you know, the work, the show, the, the exhibition. And he's like, let me see it. <laughs> so, you know, I shared it with him. And he's like, okay, so we got to talk. <laughs> but, you know, just, just having, you know, these opportunities, but, but also on the flip side, educating, you know, having more uh, curators of color, having um, um, more artists of color. I mean, and uh, culturally, um, you know, nurturing that you know, that, that the arts is, is a viable option. It's, it's creative, but it's also very viable. It's, it's hard, but so are other industries. I mean, I don't find art or, you know, design or anything, you know, any more difficult or easy than, than others. If not, it's harder. So, you know, I always find that to be, um, you know, kind of an interesting subject all on its own about you know why do you want to be an artist and you're gonna starve you're gonna do you know but <laughs> and i'm like i don't know who you know but there's a lot of non-starving artists out here and designers i mean you know it's pretty lucrative <laughs> so thank you robin i feel like with all these movements especially like the um defund the police movement I've definitely seen a trend of people kind of returning to like community-based structures of um, just like, I guess, dealing with um, like in your community, like growing networks within your community that support you and that um, help you grow and, and like uplift you. So I feel like one word of mouth, like sharing your, your other friends' opportunities. Like my friend, uh, Soraya Nicole, she's an excellent singer. She always has events going on. Speaking um, your friends' names or your other peers' names in rooms where they're not in. And um, just reposting support. Like there's a lot of ways we can support each other and uplift each other. And I feel like all of us as artists, we are all in one community. Like we are all in like one tribe. So like it really, it, I feel like there's an infinite amount of ways for us to really push each other forward and to um, open doors for each other. And yeah, that's, that's all I have to say, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I think I totally agree with Steph too. I think um, the internet's like one huge space where we can actually take advantage of that. Um, sharing each other's work when it's needed, um, you know, reposting our work and all of that, it's like really important. I think um, I've kind of been doing that like unconsciously, but I guess, I guess it just actually occurred to me when Stephanie said it. Cause then, I mean, I'm always like looking for opportunities to have like people of color to actually like um, participate in, I think, and see, uh, um, you know, like people in the clay community and all of that. Um, I think I find that very interesting. I feel like in, in doing that, it creates like this um, one solid language that we all are speaking and then people get to like listen when we do that. Um, so yeah, I think the, the internet is one great space because you never know who is watching, we never know who is listening, you never know who is seeing it. Um, it, it transcends beyond boundaries and it, it goes far than you think. Um, so, I mean, in any shape or form, in any time, if you're able to like share like a fellow artist's work, um, you know, like just um, repost it or do something, I think that, that actually also helps. Um, 
in their current space and then you know kind of like help each other to get to where we all want to be uh, it's it's very helpful yeah thank you michael well i wanted to take the time again to close out and say thank you to each and every last one of you for your time and your efforts and your beautiful um craft um, your artwork and um, taking the time out to be able, taking the time out to talk to the viewers, to talk to our viewers and our audience and to talk about your work um, and to talk about this exhibition and apologetic conversations, hair and nonconformity. And this is here the opportunity to plug any event that you have coming up. Would anyone like to plug in anything that they have that they would like for um, the audience to know about? I mean, I would just say um, my social media is really important to follow. So um, it's Liz underscore Miller underscore productions on Instagram. If you're not on Instagram, I have a Facebook page, Liz Miller Productions. I have a web page, Liz Ann Miller. And if you want to join the newsletter, you can just message me through the web page. I don't really have anything going on until September, but I've linked up with the Lynching Memorial Project in Montgomery County. They're doing a soil collection for the Equal Justice Initiative happening in September. They want to screen my film and they want to do a remembrance where I should be doing um, some more cleansing in Montgomery County in relationship to the lynchings um, that happened there. And they have some memorial sites. Um, so we'll be doing a remembrance walk in September. So I'm excited about that. I don't have any specifics. So jump on the mailing list, jump on the Instagram so you can come see it. It's amazing live. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, I have the show coming up, well, in a year. <laughs> um, look out for that at the, uh, at the um, Norma Rockwell Museum, Illustration, uh, Responsibility and Race. Um, not sure if that's going to be the title a year from now, but uh, we're working diligently on that. Um, also working with and have worked with the Twin Poets here in Delaware, and um, I illustrated a book for them, and that should be coming out the end of this month, I think. So um, that's pretty exciting. The book is called Homework for Breakfast, the 36 page color book about a kid named Chris who doesn't want to do his homework. Um, <laughs> but, um, and uh, you can find me um, on Instagram, rphillipspendleton.com, uh, my website, rphillipspendleton.com or um, rphillipspendleton on Instagram. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I don't have uh, worry. And then, well, next year I'm a part of like the Lynn Sharp show that's at the Delaware Contemporary too. Wow. So, so I have that going on. <laughs> and um, any other stuff would be on my Instagram, which is like the Sun or like the Sun Art. Uh, they're both. Yeah. You 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 uh, drifted out. Say that. Say your um inter your, um give your website again, please. Oh my my website is Kira like the sun because that's that's my middle name. So <laughs> and then uh, my Instagram's like the sun art. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, um. So I have like a show coming up in November where University of Delaware. Um. So pretty much it's like a competition of like seven different Ghanaian artists in the U.S. Um sharing their experience about their, their being in the US. Um, I'm collaborating like the Delaware Contemporary on um, working on a workshop and also get people to get to know about the show. It's it's happening in November. It's titled The Medium is the Message, the African Diaspora Story. Um, it's going to be a very interesting show. And I think everyone should take their time to be a UD in November to check it out. Um, my Instagram is McMichael D -K -D -K -A. Um, It's spelled M C M I H A E L D I K A. Um, Instagram, and then my website is MichaelDicard.com, pretty much. So if you want to get more updates on the show, just check my Instagram, and then you get more updates. Or you can also check with the Delaware Contemporary website, which will give a lot of uh, information. Uh, regarding the show and the workshop, which is coming up uh, in a few months. So definitely stay tuned for that. Thank you, Michael. And I, in closing, I, um, I have a show coming up in January um, at the Philadelphia International Airport. Vessels for my hair. So check out my work there. And you can visit my website at tsantana.com. 
Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure from the Delaware Contemporary. I wish you the best and everyone have a great evening.